Okay, so welcome to today's lecture. Last time we spoke about uh, BaFin, Deutsche Bundesbank, the European Central Bank, uh, and today we'll continue with our discussion um, based um, on the US American banking system. I told you that uh, most banking sectors in the world differ um, uh, quite strongly from each other. Um, and the US American banking sector is a good example uh, for a very unique banking sector because it's also the largest banking sector um, as it is right now. Uh, depending on the definition, I would guess that the Chinese banking sector is probably uh, nowadays as large as the US banking sector, but uh, the US American banking sector is still uh, a little bit more important than any other banking sector due to the fact that most American banks are also active on a global scale. So we'll talk about the US, US banking sector and its pecu uh, peculiarities. Um, and after that, we'll talk a little bit about supranational banks. That is banks uh, like, for example, the World Bank or the Bank for International Settlements that are supranational uh, in nature, but um, one could argue whether they should be considered a bank. One could also argue that these are supranational financial institutions um, under the supervision, for example, under the um, common roof of the United Nations, for example, or um, uh, the Bank for International Settlements is the central bank of central banks. So it's not really a bank that gives out loans to customers, but it's something different. And we'll talk about this. Um, now for research and also for the purpose of writing it, um, um, the master th uh, or bachelor thesis uh, for your degree. Um, it is very interesting to look at the differences of these um, banking sectors. Why? Um, because in many cases, uh, the differences between the US, the Japanese, the European banking sector, the differences between those banking sectors uh, can be exploited to analyze the effect of certain um, structural details of the sector and changes to the system which usually are regulation changes and tax changes. Uh, what is meant by that? Um, take, for example, the US banking sector. Um, the US banking sector is quite special and it has undergone uh, frequent changes in regulation, uh, in taxation, um, in laws that govern the way banks do business. And you could analyze, for example, the question, what effect does this or that type of regulation uh, had? What type of effect did this have on US banks? And if you see, for example, that a change in regulation has had a positive or negative effect on US banks, you could argue that if, for example, the European Central Bank would do the same, we would know that from past experience from the US, such a change in regulation is beneficial or detrimental to other banks. Um, and also, if you take banks in France, Spain, Germany, they have similar business models. Uh, they are of similar size. They all operate in the European Union. So it's, it could be considered to be one single market. But some things do differ. Taxation and regulation are not um, exactly identical from Spain to France to Germany. And if you see, for example, that small cooperative banks in Spain are more profitable or less profitable than small cooperative banks in Germany, you could deduce that, for example, some differences in regulation um, are responsible for this um, difference in profitability. This is why looking at the different banking sectors can help you in research determine the drivers of success or firm success and also the efficacy of regulatory measures. And this is this has been done uh, numerous times and especially the US is a very good, uh, very good sandbox for looking at these questions. One reason we'll see this in a couple of slides is uh, for this is that in the US uh, many things differ from state to state. 
And there was a time when in the US, banks were not allowed to operate in more than one state. They were not allowed to open branches, if, for example, in Arkansas, if they were located in California. And this um, led to a situation where you had banks all over the US, but you had different types of regulation in all 50 states. And those um, rules were abolished in the 70s, 80s and 90s, and the market was integrated. And at some point you could see that, for example, this change in regulation had, um, did have a positive effect on banks. But I'll talk about this in a minute. So at this point, it suffices to say that the differences in the different um, banking sectors in the US um, and in the world uh, helps us and these differences help us to understand how regulation, especially regulation, and how business models uh, for banks work and uh, what effects they have. Now, um, I've already pointed out that um, the US um, banking system has undergone numerous changes over the past couple of decades and even centuries. It was originally designed as a universal banking system. That didn't work out uh, in the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, and after that, it was transformed into a separate banking system where you had <laughs> investment banking and commercial banking uh, strictly separated from each other um, as part of the regulation put in place by the so-called Glass-Steagall Act. Um, in 1999, the graham leach Bliley Act, write this down, Graham Leach Bliley, that's G L B A, um, as one of the uh, lesser known but most important uh, pieces of legislation of the Clinton administration, the Graham Leach Bliley Act. It revised numerous portions of the um, um, Glass-Steagall Act and as an effect banks were now allowed to operate in both commercial banking and investment banking. If you take a look at the average size of US banks you can see that average size increased in the 90s and at some point it went like this. Why? Because all banks started to merge and to buy up commercial and or investment banks because Obviously, the market, um, there wasn't much room for natural and organic growth. So what did banks do? They bought other banks, they merged and uh, acquired other banks uh, in order to um, enter into commercial or investment banking, depending on what they did um, before that. So this was the Graham Leach Bliley Act in 1999. And if you take um, a textbook, um, that talks about the US banking sector, they will have a hard time uh, clearly identifying the US sector uh, banking system as a truly separate uh, banking system or a truly universal banking system because it now has, it has features of both systems. Um, after the financial crisis, we went back from allowing everything to being more restrictive when it comes to proprietary trading, universal banking, investment banking, commercial banking. That uh, piece of legislation um, is called the Dodd-Frank Act. And it installed thresholds, I think, at 10, 10 and $50 billion um, total assets. And if you are a bank and if you cross this threshold of total assets exceeding 10 or 50 billion um, dollars, you suddenly face much tougher regulation and supervision. So if you are a large bank with more than 50 billion dollars in total assets, you become more um, important to regulators and supervisors. Which types of banks uh, do we have in the US system? Uh, we have commercial banks, we have investment banks, brokers, security dealers, 
um, we have other non-banks or near banks, and we have so-called thrift institutions. Um, what are thrift institutions? Can you explain what thrift institutions are? No? What does thrift mean? Okay, um, well, you can see from the subdivision what is meant here. You have mutual savings banks and credit unions. Those are cooperative banks and you have savings and loan associations. So the thrift institutions are more or less those banks that do not 100% aim at profit maximization, but those companies are more interested in offering services to the general public and in most times especially the credit unions those are cooperative companies like the Volksbanken in Germany and you also have savings and loan associations that usually are compared to um, the German Sparkassen but this is I guess not a very good comparison because the German Sparkassen are state-owned and savings and loan associations are a little bit different. But those are, this is the, the major distinction you can make and differentiation you can do um, when it comes to the different types of banks. You have commercial banks, um, those are privately owned banks um, that try to maximize profits and you have thrift institutions, those are typical banks, uh, usually cooperatives, and then you also have investment banks, brokers, dealers, other non-banks or near banks, um, and it depends on the type of definition you want to use, whether some companies and financial institutions are considered a bank or whether they are not a bank. It also depends on the uh, point of time you're looking at. At some points, for example, um, all the banks uh, wanted to be considered a commercial bank. Uh, and not just an investment bank or a broker. The reason for that was that after the financial crisis, uh, the US government um, put uh, in place a system and a, and a program called TARP. Does anyone know what TARP means and what TARP stands for? The by far largest bailout program in US history. It's the Troubled Assets Relief Program. This was the bailout <coughs> program that um, the US government, the federal government installed together with the Fed in order to buy up toxic assets from banks during the financial crisis. And this is the multi-billion, I think just billion, not trillion, uh, the multi-billion dollar program that was used uh, to save the US financial system from totally collapsing. And to be eligible to get funds from TARP, you needed to be a commercial bank. So at that point in time, all the investment banks, they desperately wanted to be considered a commercial bank in order to get the bailout money from the TARP program. So this is, so this is the TARP program, and this is why sometimes uh, it doesn't make too much sense to make a distinction between an investment bank or a commercial bank. Uh, sometimes it's just a definition a uh, question of definition um, by regulators and supervisors. So let's start with the classical commercial banks. Those are the banks that have uh, deposit and lending business. Um, you have large examples like, for example, Bank of America, Citigroup. Um, over the 90s uh, and 80s, um, this combination of bad lending, missing diversification, and also a decline in overall economic um, uh, stance um, and the overall economic situation in the US led to uh, numerous bankruptcies um, and as a result also in combination with um, the Graham Leach Bliley Act in 99 uh, commercial banks merged and merged and merged. Today we still have a huge number of banks in the US much more uh, than, for example, in Europe, but still uh, the number was even higher 
in the 70s and 80s. Um, and if you've ever been to the US, it's quite easy to understand how this worked. Why? Uh, in some cases, you have banks that only operate one branch and they look like a petrol station. They look like a gas station. They have one branch, maybe five employees, and that's just the local bank. But whereas, for example, here in Germany, you would have a local Sparkasse, a state-owned bank uh, in the um, property uh, of the municipality or the city, with maybe two branches and uh, 30 employees, um, and the Sparkasse is affiliated with all the Sparkassen sector. Um, in the US, this would be an individual bank operating on its own. And this is why you have a, a much higher number of commercial banks in the US than, for example, here in Germany. And of course, the US is much larger than Germany. That also is a contributing factor. So we've seen a huge consolidation wave. That is also one explanation for the fact that mergers and bank mergers are a frequent topic in research, um, because you can study why do firms and banks merge? Why does bank A buy bank B? Is it a good merger? Is it a bad value enhancing or value destroying merger? And this is, um, this is a frequent topic in research. Thrift institutions, uh, well, you, could you could translate with um, the German Spar and Darlehenskassen. Uh, this is the second big group of banks. Um, you have mutual savings banks. Again, if you ever see the word mutual, uh, you should know that these are companies operating as a cooperative union in German Genossenschaft. Um, those are mutual companies. In insurance, we have the same. We have uh, many companies that operate as a mutual insurer. Um, the mutual savings banks are mainly located in New England for historical reasons. Uh, the savings and loan associations and credit unions are also thrift institutions. And similar to the German savings banks, to the German Sparkassen and uh, the cooperatives, they are usually not necessarily uh, in the possession of the depositors. So the depositors are the shareholders. Um, and they usually do not try to maximize profits, but they try to provide, um, to promote lending um, and saving and to provide financial services to their customers, aka the shareholders. You know? And obviously at a much smaller scale and at a local level. You might have heard of this. Um, in the 80s, um, there was also a, a big crisis in the US uh, banking system, um, the infamous savings and loan crisis, the SNL crisis. Um, between 86 and 95, approximately 1,000 out of the 3,000 uh, savings and loan associations in the US went bankrupt. And what was the reason for this? First of all, um, you had, I think this was uh, under Jimmy Carter, uh, you had uh, a deregulation um, by the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act, and uh, banks had now the permission, uh, the permission to offer uh, additional products. Um, however, um, there was no change in the capital regulation of banks, so they had more business opportunities, but they, the supervision did not change. Then under Reagan, um, you had a large tax reform, the Tax Reform Act of 86. It eliminated tax rebates for real estate investments, and the result was that uh, the real estate values decreased, um, and banks had uh, to write off their assets. They had given out mortgage loans, um, and because asset prices, uh, house pr housing prices went down, they had to write off um, some of the values of their assets, of their mortgage loans. You had a rise in base rates to fight inflation, um, and a resulting increase in the refinancing costs for the banks that had given out mortgage loans. And you had a lack of diversification due to the fact that, especially the savings and loan associations, were very invested locally. If you are a very small bank and if you have given out all your loans in the type of mortgage loans to local customers, 
and housing prices go down in your neighborhood, uh, then of course you don't have any diversification to counter those uh, write-offs in your mortgage loan portfolio. And as a result, uh, one third of all savings and loan associations went bankrupt in the 80s and 90s. You can see that this was not a sudden crisis like the financial crisis of uh, 2008, 2009. Um, it was uh, a more, a much slower crisis, but uh, at that time, uh, the most detrimental crisis uh, the financial system in the US had ever seen. And it's also interesting to see that um, if you change the names of the acts, you could see the blueprint for the financial crisis just 20 years before. You have a change in regulation, Banks are suddenly allowed to do business where before they were not allowed to do business. Supervision doesn't change. So this is nice for the banks. They get, uh, they engage more in risk taking. Uh, in this case, the Tax Reform Act depreciated and, and led to decreasing housing prices. In the financial crisis, it was the fact that at some point people realized that they were no longer able uh, to pay their mortgages. Why were they not able to pay their mortgages? Uh, because uh, Alan Greenspan increased uh, interest rates. And in the financial crisis, the, the risk was spread all over across the world. In the SNL crisis, the risk were more or less um, concentrated in the US. But it's exactly the same blueprint as the financial crisis. More risk taking, no, um, no real supervision, um, not a very tough regulation, uh, increase in interest rates by central banks, um, and again, uh, the housing market. Uh, now, if you take a look at the housing market right now in the European Union, and I guess it's the same in the US, one could <laughs> get the idea that it might be that we have an asset price bubble in the housing market. So. Um, I guess we'll just see history repeating again in a couple of years uh, with mortgage uh, loans uh, causing yet another uh, crisis. As you can see, the SNL crisis had uh, caused damage of approximately $160 billion at the time. Um, at that time, it was huge. Uh, after the financial crisis, one had to say, OK, crisis can get even bigger than this, but at that time was a huge disaster. And it led to the establishment of the OTS, the Office of Thrift Supervision, the Savings Association Insurance Fund, and the Resolution Trust Corporation. And just like with the European uh, Banking, um, European Banking Authority, uh, and the idea of a European Banking Union, uh, it's always three pillars, you can see. The first one is supervision. Actually, we have this in the European Union now because as you uh, have seen the last time, um, the systemically important banks are nowadays in the European Union, are nowadays supervised by the ECB. Supervision has been delegated from the national central banks to the European central banks. So supervision is one pillar. The second pillar is deposit insurance. Now in the European Union, we cannot agree on uh, a joint system of deposit insurance because especially we Germans are afraid that the Greek banks will steal our money. Yeah? This is uh, unfortunately uh, the, the populist uh, view of some politicians in the European Union that if you install a European Union-wide system of deposit insurance will have some incentive or some countries might have an incentive to exploit this system. Could be true not be true, and resolution, and we also have that in the European Banking Union now. So these are usually the three pillars uh, you want to install if you want to toughen up um, banking regulation and supervision. Supervision, deposit insurance, and resolution. Okay. Now, thrift super, uh, institutions, commercial banks, uh, those are two types of banks we have in the US, and the third group is investment banks. Investment banks, as the name suggests, engage in investment banking. That's trivial. Um, some examples are Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, 
and um, they, in contrast to some European banks, some of these investment banks, they only engage in investment banking. Why? Because they were the first ones to come up with the idea of investment banking. Uh, banks like uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, those are the, the industry leaders in this field and they virtually invented the art of investment banking and they are world leading in their field. Um, that is why they don't really need to do other business, they just stick to investment banking. Banks in Germany, for example, like Deutsche Bank, they, they came from commercial banking and at some point in time they realized that money was to be made and could be made in investment banking as well, so they entered investment banking at a much later stage. We also have securities brokers and securities dealers, uh, the former trade in securities without, whereas the latter trade with own holdings, so there's a slight difference between brokers and dealers. And the brokers live on commissions. Uh, this is funny because many times you see um, a movie uh, on bad things happening at uh, Wall Street. On Wall Street, it's usually that they show brokers and dealers. You, you see, uh, you see, uh, what's his name? You see Charlie Sheen in Wall Street sitting on a. On, near a telephone and calling institutional investors and trying to sell securities. This is not an, usually it's not an investment bank, this is not a commercial bank, this is a securities uh, broker. He tries to sell securities and if he sells a security, uh, a stock, he will get a commission. This is the business brokers do. And dealers, um, they um, also trade uh, with their own holdings and they usually live of the bid ask spread. What's a, what is a bid ask spread? Does everyone know? If you have an asset, if you want to sell it or if you want to buy it, you have two prices, one bid quote and one ask quote. The difference between the bid and the ask quote is the bid ask spread and what does the bid ask spread tell you? Quite simple. Let's assume I bought this pen for 10 euros. What are you willing to give me for this pen? Probably not 10 euros. It's used, let's assume it's brand new, but why should you buy it from me if you can buy the same pen from the store? Huh? So you will probably only give me 8 euros. So there's a bit R spread of 2 euros. Now. How much would you give me for a 10 euro note? 10 euros. So bid, the bid ask spread is a proxy for the liquidity of an asset. If an asset is very illiquid, the bid ask spread will be high. For um, cash, by definition, the most liquid asset there is, you will have a zero bid ask spread. This is also quite clear. So the higher the bid ask spread, the higher the illiquidity of an asset. And this is actually interesting because there are some other additional proxies. But the bid ask spread is just the probably the best proxy for an asset's liquidity. And why can a security dealer live off the bid ask spread? Because one would assume that illiquidity is bad. It usually is. A security dealer would offer quote. The security dealer would stand ready to buy or sell an asset. And I could, for example, um, I could function um, and I could uh, act as a dealer for, say, apples. Uh, not a very good example. Let's uh, let's say. Uh, the stock of Facebook. Uh, I will stand ready to buy at ten dollars uh, and I will sell at twelve dollars. Now the bid ask spread in this case is two dollars. Obviously I will buy for ten, I will sell for twelve, meaning I will earn two dollars on each stock I buy and sell. Now, do I have stocks of Facebook? Currently, no. This is my job. 
I need to make sure that if someone wants to buy or wants to sell, I can sell or buy the stock. And this is what my job is, what I'm being paid for. But I'm offering you the possibility to buy and sell the stock and I'm guaranteeing you a bid ask spread of two euros. Now, if I see that everyone wants to trade in Facebook stocks, I can say, okay, I'm now offering to buy at 11 and sell at 12. I'm lowering the bid ask spread because I'm just dealing in volume. And you can see that trading volume increases, the stock gets more liquid and the bid ask spread will decrease. And because I'm risking that I'm not able to net my position, I'm being paid a risk premium, more or less, and this is the bid ask spread. And this is how I can make money. Why would someone like me do this? Because I'm earning, I'm hopefully good in my business and I'm earning money. Uh, why would a stock exchange support me? Because a stock exchange is interested in someone in the market offering liquidity. And in this case, a security dealer will increase market liquidity by standing ready to buy and sell at fixed quotes. Okay, so this is a security dealer. And you also have non-banks and near banks. What are non-banks or near banks? More or less, those are financial institutions like pension funds, mutual funds, money market funds, even insurance companies that are not officially considered to be a bank, but they should be considered a bank or near bank because they engage in banking-like activities. And this is closely related to shadow banking. We'll talk about this later. So you have funds, you have factoring and leasing companies, financial services companies within industrial companies, for example, uh, the classical type uh, of an automobile bank, Toyota Bank, Volkswagen Bank, etc. So you have a bank inside an industrial conglomerate. Um, and these are financial intermediaries with banking-like characteristics or that offer banking services. And in many cases, these companies are not regulated and supervised as banks, but they function as banks and they act as banks. And this is closely related to shadow banking. Now, in the last two or three decades, uh, this sector has emerged that is now called the shadow banking sector. Um, and what is a shadow bank? A shadow bank is a financial institution that legally operates banking and that legally offers banking operations and banking services, but that is not a bank under the given country's laws. For example, if I were to start uh, giving out loans, it is quite clear that in, under the German Banking Act by law, I would be considered a bank and I would be supervised. If you give out loans, you're a bank. That's what the German Banking Act says. But there are some parts uh, in banking where you can actually offer banking services and you can exploit loopholes in the probably not the German banking law, but in some other countries' banking laws. And you are actually, economically speaking, you are a bank, but legally no one has noticed the fact that you are a bank and you are just considered, for example, a regular industrial company, or you are considered to be a financial service company, which, again, in Germany uh, requires l much uh, less regulation and supervision than if you are considered a full, that if you if you have a full banking license, and some examples are, for example, money market funds. They gave out loans to banks, and they acted as uh, financiers of banks via the interbank market, and during the financial crisis, uh, regulators and central banks realized that uh, powerful players in the financial market were actually had given out huge loans and huge amounts of financing to other banks. So in a sense, they were acting, I would guess, as investment banks, but they weren't supervised or regulated as banks. 
In many cases, of course, they also have their headquarters on the Cayman Islands, on the Bermudan Islands, etc. And these financial institutions were not supervised at all, and central banks and supervisors didn't, didn't have them on their radar. And this is why they are called shadow banks. It, it is legal, and one has to stress this, that this is not something that is illegal, at least at that point in time. It's legal, but it's part of what we consider to be reg regulatory arbitrage. What is, first of all, what is arbitrage? One of those nasty words no one knows outside of economics. And if you've studied economics long enough, a word that will enter your um, your dictionary um, and you will use it just like diversification. At some point I had to realize that my parents did not know what diversification means. I found that quite strange. But arbitrage is also one of these words. You will, From now on you will use frequently but no one else understands if, you, if he or she hasn't studied economics. What is arbitrage? Yeah? It's a movement which um, decreases differences. Mm. Say. Yeah, correct idea. Like when there is a need of money on the one yeah. side, then the money goes to this side. You're describing the um, the effect uh, we will observe when people exploit an arbitrage opportunity. Arbitrage is defined as the opportunity uh, to earn a risk-free profit by exploiting differences in prices. And one could say that a reverse engineer definition would be arbitrage is, the, is, the, uh, is a violation of the law of one price. The law of one price states that if you have one asset in two places, or at two times, probably, or two places at the same time, that are identical, they should have the same price. If you buy a pair of shoes on the left-hand side here for 100 euros, it should have the same price in the store on the right-hand side of the street. Now, there shouldn't be two prices for the same asset, for the same good. Okay. If you do have two prices, you have an arbitrage opportunity. You can exploit the arbitrage opportunity by doing what? Buying low, selling high. And by doing this, the, the things you described will happen. Prices will uh, get back into equilibrium. And you have so-called arbitrageurs, people who exploit arbitrage opportunities, and they will force prices back again into equilibrium. But arbitrage on itself is defined as this opportunity to exploit a difference in prices for the same good. And we're not talking about apples and pears. We are talking about an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. So the, the asset has to be the same. Yeah? I'm not talking about a nice pair of shoes on the left side and a different pair of shoes on the right side. We're talking about one stock of Facebook. It's the same whether you buy it in London, it's the same whether you buy it in New York. And if you have two prices, and you have no good reason for the difference in prices, for example, transportation costs, then you can exploit this arbitrage opportunity. And this idea of exploiting loopholes or market frictions to earn a risk-free profit this idea was transferred to the realm of regulation and regulatory arbitrage is what? More or less exploiting differences in regulation from one country to another or in a more general sense exploiting loopholes in regulation. And this was done here. Banks, especially banks and some financial institutions saw that well, how did they exploit this loophole in regulation? That you could offer banking-like services and give out loans to large institutions and funds, 
without being considered a bank and without being supervised like a bank. Where's the, where's the advantage of doing this business without being uh, formally a bank? It's like a game show here. You have time to answer the question while I'm slowly writing down the answer. No idea? It's quite simple. If you are not considered a bank, you do not have to face capital regulation. You can give out loans, you can give out financing to other large financial institutions, but you don't have to fulfill any capital ratios. You can operate with much higher leverage, and this is a recipe for disaster. You are highly levered, you have way too much leverage, you are not properly supervised, Central banks don't know what you're doing and you're dealing in wholesale funding and financing for other banks. And this is what happened during the financial crisis. People suddenly realized that there were players in the financial market, no supervision at all, no capital regulation. Uh, with no capital regulation, they were able to give out, uh, to have good rates uh, and good prices for their financing. Uh, but as soon as those funds started to have problems, central banks got nervous, right? And this is shadow banking. Um, there is a, I would say now, quite famous paper in Econometrica um, by Ralph Coyen. I hope this is in Yogo. Now, Yogo, I know how the name is spelled. Yogo Motohiro. Yogo is a professor at Princeton now. And uh, Ralph Koyen is a professor at the University of Chicago at the Booth School now. Uh, they, wrote, uh, they wrote a paper called Shadow Insurance uh, two or three years ago uh, in Econometrica. Shadow insurance is something a little bit different, but it has the same idea and the same principle. In the US, um, it is possible, um, I've forgotten the name. What's the name? Um, uh, uh, now, in, uh, do you know how insurance works? Basically, insurance, reinsurance? Does anyone not know how reinsurance works? Okay, most of you know. So if you are a primary insurer, uh, at some points you realize you have taken up too much risk and you sell your risks to a reinsurer. You reduce risk for a fee and the reinsurer takes up this risk and by diversification um, both companies can do fine and you have insurance and reinsurance. Uh, in the US, um, on no, usually, um, in the world, you can observe that many insurance groups have insurance business, but they also have an affiliated reinsurance company within the company, within the uh, uh, conglomerate group. Uh, do you know any famous examples? We have one very famous example here in Germany. Everyone should know that. What's the largest reinsurance company in the world? Munich Re. And Munich Re is also the second largest German insurance company. Do you know the name? It's a 100% uh, subsidiary of Munich Re, Münchner Rück, and S. Versicherungsunternehmen. No one knows that. Ergo. Ergo is the insurance subsidiary of Munich Re here in Germany. There used to be DKV, DAS, Hamburg, Mannheimer, Victoria, but they now merged all those uh, brands under the name Ergo. And what in, this is also true in the US. You have companies, insurance companies, that also own affiliated reinsurance companies. I think that there is a special name for that. I've forgotten how it's called. It's, I mean, the basic idea is that it's an affiliated reinsurance company within an insurance group. But I think there's uh, 
uh, what's I, I wanted to say convict no it's I've forgotten the name the vocabulary is is reminiscent of the fact that it's um, that the reinsurance company is closely related and dependent on the insurance group. Captives, captives, that's the name, captive reinsurer. That's a, it's, it's an insurance, reinsurance company that is affiliated with and part of a larger insurance group. Now, what you can do, of course, is if you have insurance business, you can sell your uh, contracts and your insurance business in part to another reinsurance company. That's okay, that's fine. But you can also sell it within your group to your own reinsurance company, meaning that the risks stay within your company. You have reinsurance in your captive um, and there is no big diversification here going on. In, in the US, it is possible to have your captive reinsurer more or less off balance sheet on the Cayman Islands or Bermudan Islands uh, and you can sell your insurance business in part to your captive reinsurer in the Bermudan Islands and you can circumvent capital regulation by this. And uh, Koyan and Yogo calculated that I think it amounts to almost 15 or 20 cents on the dollar in insurance premiums that companies can save by circumventing capital regulation for their reinsurance business because the captive reinsurers uh, are outside US uh, regulation. Problem, however, is that those captive reinsurers, they usually have huge guarantees by US banks. And the idea then is that if insurance business, insurance companies have a problem, they don't have real reinsurance because their captive reinsurer it's just uh, set up in place to circumvent capital regulation so they don't have too much capital. And if the captive reinsurer goes bankrupt, the insurance company goes bankrupt. But suddenly, because most captive reinsurers have gotten re um, guarantees by banks, problems from the insurance uh, sector could uh, backfire to the US banking system. And at that point, this paper made a huge made a lot of noise with regulators and supervisors because suddenly regulators realized there could be a problem where we least expected it in the insurance sector. And since then, um, regulators have become highly aware of problems that could arise from the insurance sector. Fun fact on the side, uh, Koyan and Yogo uh, wrote this paper in Econometrica and they are not ne uh, necessarily, they, they work in insurance, but they are economists. They are very good economists, that, but they are not part of the insurance and risk management community. And at that point, uh, a professor from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania wrote uh, a, um, an article um, that said, more or less, I don't know what the big fuss is. We, we in the risk and uh, insurance community have known about this for a long time. This is no big problem. Um, you, you're, you're, um, you're blowing this, this out of proportion. Small footnote, financed by the American Association of Life Insurance. Yeah? So this, uh, this um, piece uh, of work in this paper written by uh, this guy from Wharton, uh, that contradicted Koyan and Yogo's statement on shadow insurance was at least in part financed by the American Association of Life Insurance. So you can, um, one could argue that this uh, was uh, in part uh, an effort by, um, by the insurance business to counter any tougher supervision by regulators. So this is shadow banking, shadow insurance, some other characteristic of shadow banks. Usually these are hedge funds, money market funds, exchange traded funds, private equity funds, security brokers. And in general, uh, a defining property is that they do not finance themselves through deposits, so they don't take in any deposits, which is quite clear. If they were to take in deposits, everyone knew, would know that they are a bank. Uh, the idea is that you, you slip under the regulator's 
radar. And if you were to uh, accept deposits, well, everyone would know that you're a bank. Therefore, they are not subject to the usual regulation of banks, and this is what we refer to as regulatory arbitrage. And often shadow banks are subsidiaries of banks, but have their business uh, conducted outside um, the parent's company's balance sheet. So this is more or less off balance sheet. Now, what is the business model of these shadow banks? They grant loans and investments in securities. They finance themselves via short-term ABS or repo transactions. What are repo transactions? If you don't know this, look it up. Repurchase agreements. Uh, in German, Wertpapierleihgeschäfte. So what you do is you have securities, you lend out securities, you get financing, and at the end of your loan, more or less, you have agreed to repurchase the security you have given out as a collateral. So in German, the, this type of security or this type of financial contract is called Wertpapierleihgeschäft. Um, and this is one of the major financing tools in the interbank sector, in the interbank market. And in the financial crisis, you could see only a few classical traditional bank runs, like in the case of Northern Rock in the UK, where actually people started to line up before the bank branches. But you, you didn't really have a, a, classical, uh, a classic uh, bank run per se. What you did have was a run on repo a run of banks on repo transactions in the interbank market. And if you ever, you were probably too young to, to follow this during the financial crisis. But at that time, people talked about not a bank run, but uh, they talked about problems in the interbank market, that banks were no longer willing to grant loans to other banks. And you don't give out loans, but you use repo transactions in the interbank market. And this is why the um, financial crisis did not see too many traditional bank runs by customers, but it saw a run on repo, a run on repo <coughs> transactions. The problem with shadow banking now is, of course, that you have a lack of transparency, you have inadequate regulation and supervision, you have way too high leverage because you can circumvent capital regulation. And why use too much capital? You can use just leverage and uh, debt. And you have a high degree of interdependence with other banks because those are usually your main clients and business partners. So these are shadow banks. Let's come back to the question, what types of banks do we have in the US? Regardless of whether you are an investment bank or no, whether you are a commercial bank or a thrift supervision, we can first differentiate between federally chartered and state chartered. This means that if you ever see a US bank that has a name in it like First National Bank of, let's say, Kentucky, or First State Bank of Louisiana, these words national or federal or state, they indicate whether you are federally chartered, that means chartered, you have been given your license to operate uh, from the federal government or at the federal level, or whether you are chartered at the state level, for example, in Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana. And depending on the question whether you are a state bank or a national bank or a federal savings bank, uh, you are authorized and supervised by either the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency or the Federal Reserve and the FDIC. So state banks are supervised by state, national banks are authorized and supervised by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, that's the OCC, state banks. And then you can decide on whether you want to be a member of the Fed system or not. And this is also different to, for example, the system of the central bank in Germany and Europe. In Germany, you are, as a, as, a, as a commercial bank, you are not part of, German, of the German Deutsche Bundesbank. You are not part of the central bank. In the US, the Federal Reserve System is not one bank, 
First of all, it's an, a number of Federal Reserve Banks plus the member banks and all federally, uh, all the state banks that have opted to uh, enter the Federal Reserve System, they are a member of the Federal Reserve System. You had a question. Yeah, what does the first stand for? Why first? Oh, that's just for marketing purposes. Okay. Yeah. So, but usually these are the names of these banks. First National, yeah, because, uh, yeah, you're just first. Yeah. I think uh, we don't have this in Germany, but I think in Austria it's it's common for some companies to also uh, like uh, for some some insurance companies uh, they also carry the name Erste, Erste Allgemeine Feuerversicherung, Erste Allgemeine Brandschutzversicherung, and stuff like that. They also have this tradition of uh, calling themselves first company to do this and this you know? type of business. State banks that are members of the Federal Reserve Systems, they are automatically supervised by the Fed. State banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve System are supervised by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. Again, you can see it gets complicated because the F Deposit Insurance Corporation, the organization responsible for deposit insurance, is also a supervisor. So it has a mixed uh, task here. And commercial banks are thus controlled by a state and by one of the two federal supervisors, FDIC or Federal Reserve System. And this is what we call the dual banking system, that each bank, each uh, commercial bank is automatically supervised by two institutions at two levels. Now, the Federal Reserve System, as you know, is the central banking system of the US. It consists of 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, and the member banks. By the way, national banks, federal savings banks, they have to be, they must be members of the Federal Reserve System. State banks can opt to be member of the Federal Reserve Bank. In addition to its functions as a central bank, the Federal Reserve System supervises and regulates all member banks, and this is approximately one third of all banks in the US. It's very interesting to see how this evolved, and it's very typical of everything that has happened uh, in the US. Why? In this respect, Germany and I guess all countries in, in Europe are quite boring. We used to have one central bank, the Bank of England was even founded a couple of centuries ago. We've always only had one central bank. It stayed that central bank. And in Germany, for example, we used to have uh, a central bank um, in each period, but it's virtually stayed the same, just with a different name. And then after the foundation of this of the current German Republic, uh, we got Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Bundesbank, um, and we have always had one central bank at the federal level. In the US, this is um, related to a much, much deeper issue. Should it be an issue for the states or for the federal government? Do we need a federal or do we need a central bank at all? Do we need a federal bank at the federal level or should this be left to states? And this is why um, at some point, after, I guess, probably during the American Revolution and the Revolutionary War, the founding fathers realized we need a central bank to finance the Revolutionary War. But after that, just like with everything else in US politics, take slavery uh, and take states' rights, uh, there has always been a political struggle concerning the question, should we have a central bank that is uh, at the federal level, or should this be something that is governed at the state level? Same with a single currency. Um, at some point, they realized, OK, we need to have one single currency, the dollar. Uh, and that also changed over time. This is the current Federal Reserve System. Um, it's, I've forgotten the name. Actually, this is the usual, um, um, usual um, map 
of the federal system in the US. Um, and this is also the same for the federal uh, courts. Uh, you can see, for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up to 12. I think these are called the federal circuits. Uh, meaning that, for example, in each federal circuit, you also have one, uh, you have um, the same federal courts and the federal appellate courts. Uh, I don't want, want to go too much into detail, but it's quite clear that in the US, you have uh, some things that are punished uh, and punishable at the state level. And in some cases, you have federal offenses meaning that you are in violation of not just a county law, uh, but you're in violation of, um, a, f um, of a US uh, code law. Uh, and then it's a federal offense and you are probably being tried at the federal level by a federal court. No? And then it depends on where you committed the crime and it will go to a federal circuit court in one of these regions. And these areas are the same for the Federal Reserve System. So for example here, one, you have one Federal Reserve Bank which is located in Boston. Two, New York, Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is also considered uh, primus inter pares, meaning that it's Although all the Federal Reserve Banks have the same rights, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York is special because it is responsible for the largest part of the US financial sector. And it's the largest bank, it holds the lar world's largest gold reserves, etc. Uh, I think this is the Federal Reserve Bank in... Uh, let me just, I have to go back. You have one in Richmond, Virginia, and you have one in Philadelphia. It should be Philadelphia. Uh, you have one in Cleveland, uh, Atlanta, uh, St. Louis, Chicago, Minneapolis, Kansas City. I don't know whether Kansas City, Kansas, or Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, one in Dallas, I think, uh, and one in San Francisco. And those are the 12 Federal Reserve Banks uh, and all the governors of these 12 banks, they form, they are part of the Federal Reserve Board, obviously. You, know, you have a chairman and the governors of the Federal Reserve Banks and they, this is what usually outside the US we would consider to be the Fed. You know? That is actually the Federal Reserve Board and all the governors and the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, they uh, they form the Federal Reserve Board, which has its seat in Washington, D.C. You also have the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, that's the supervisory and regulatory authority, besides the Fed for all national banks and thrift supervisions. You have the FDIC, which is the supervisor for those banks um, that are not supervised by the Federal Reserve. So the state banks that are not part of the Fed system. And that also acts as the Deposit Insurance Authority of the US. Uh, and credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration. Um, this is something that is quite interesting because there is um, the, the FDIC membership is actually used in advertising uh, by banks. If you walk, um, if you walk uh, past um, a bank branch in the US, uh, in many cases you will see a small note, FDIC insured. So they will advertise with the fact that they are part of the FDIC and that their deposits are insured because in the US history uh, there were many episodes where actually people lost their deposits when banks went bankrupt because they did not have a deposit insurance in place. And so this is something uh, banks will advertise. Now with securities trading and investment banking it's much easier. Securities trading, investment banking, SEC, full stop. So all investment banks, securities trade uh, dealers, etc. they are supervised by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. 
because it's quite clear you don't have deposits. Uh, it's all connected with securities uh, and it makes sense to have the SEC supervise investment banks. So this is quite different. And you can see that obviously due to the fact that the US has the largest banking sector in the world, you have a very uh, intricate system of supervision. You have the OCC, you used to have the Office of Thrift Supervision that actually was uh, abolished after the financial crisis. You have the OCC, you have the Fed, you have the FDIC, you have the SEC uh, and the NCUA uh, and some smaller agencies that all work together or they should all work together with state regulators and supervisors to supervise all banks that operate in the US. Okay, any questions regarding the US system? Now let's talk about um, supranational banks. Um, we've seen national banks and international banks. Um, let's now turn to supranational banks. Uh, those are usually supported and supervised by several countries and fulfill certain promotional tasks worldwide. Uh, and they are usually not subject to one country's single national supervision. And there are only a, a number of examples for supranational banks. The World Bank, or more precisely the World Bank Group, uh, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, uh, the Bank for International Settlements, and here in the European Union, the European Investment Bank. Actually, the IMF is not even a bank, but it's usually subsumed in this group of supranational banks. Uh, well, let's shortly discuss all those four supranational banks. The World Bank Group <coughs> is not one bank, it's not the World Bank, but it's the World Bank Group that includes five different financial institutions. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD, the International Development Association, the International Finance Corporation, the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and the International Center for Settlement of Investment D Disputes. Now, legally, these are five independent organizations, but in practice, they are all under one roof and they are administratively well integrated. So. You, this is why it's usually just uh, considered to be the World Bank. But legally, those are five different um, organizations. The goal is development aid in less developed member states of the United Nations. So it's an organization of the United Nations. Uh, and its primary and only goal is development aid, Entwicklungshilfe. And one has to keep this in mind because people outside economics usually uh, cannot differentiate between the World Bank and the IMF. And those two organizations have very different aims and goals. The World Bank <coughs> tries to help developing countries. How does it do this? Um, well, you can, you can see it from the names. Bank for Reconstruction and Development, Development Association, Finance Corporation, uh, Guarantees, and Settling Investment Disputes. The World Bank Group does not give out transfer payments. So you will not get um, a free loan. You will not get uh, money that you, will not, uh, that you do not need to repay, but um, it gives out loan at lower interest rates. That's the idea of the World Bank. Now, the IBRD, uh, in this case, the members of the United Nations hold shares of capital in relation to their economic strength. It can raise capital and it grants development aid loans at lower interest rates. The IDA has the same objective as the IBRD, but loans are granted interest-free or strongly discounted, no own raising of capital on the market, but financing through contributions from member states. Uh, IFC promotes private sector development in developing and emerging countries, financing through the UN member contributions, IBRD borrowing, retained earnings and bond issues. And you can see why uh, this is more or less considered to be one bank. Uh, there are slight differences between the five, but uh, it, the differences are only concerned about and only related to uh, the type and the source of financing for, 
the five banks. Then MIGA gives out guarantees with the aim to promote foreign direct investments and uh, this uh, settlement uh, of disputes. Uh, well, it promotes dispute resolution between states and investors within the framework of bilateral and multilateral investment protection agreements. This is the World Bank development aid. Uh, and historically, you might know that the World Bank um, is uh, usually headed by someone from the US. Uh, there was, for the best part of the last decades, there was a gentleman's agreement between, the, um, between Europe and the US that the World Bank is always headed by someone from the US and the IMF is always headed by someone from Europe. Uh, now this will change in, at some point in time because obviously China, Brazil and other uh, emerging countries uh, also have a justified claim at a high position at one of these organizations, especially uh, with the World Bank, which is part of the UN. Now this is the World Bank Development Aid. The International Monetary Fund is a specialized organization of the UN and its tasks are the promotion of international cooperation in monetary policy, the extension of world trade, the stabilize, stabilization of exchange rates and other purposes. And for this, the IMF can act as a lender of last resort to member states. So a fundamental difference between the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank tries to give out loans uh, to developing countries. The IMF acts as a lender of last resort to failing states that are close to sovereign default. And the IMF tries to implement policies that stabilize exchange rate and that promote global trade. The voting rights, so-called special drawing rights, and payment obligations are determined by a distribution formula, in particular an amount that reflects the economic strength of each member state, meaning that large economies like the US, European Union, they pay uh, more money into the IMF than other smaller countries. And if you pay more, you have more votes. It's the rule in the IMF. And that is why uh, critics um, claim and argue that uh, the IMF is just dominated uh, by the large uh, countries that pay um, the majority of money into the IMF. That is, that it's a party run by the US and the European Union, which is in part true. And criticism also comes from other people that argue that uh, the granting of loans uh, only happens in connection with so-called structural adjustment programs. And the last example, especially here in the European Union, uh, the IMS is, is also infamous for implementing structural programs, for example, in Argentina and in South America. But uh, most recently, they were heavily criticized for their activity in Greece. Uh, and they, they joined forces with the Euro system and the European Union, and they stabilized Greece. The question is, at what price? They forced Greece and they forced politicians to implement structural changes and political reforms. But this is a very difficult question uh, coming from a, uh, from, a, from a political standpoint. Why? No one elected the IMF. The IMF is an organization of the UN that has only been, it's, it hasn't even been voted on. It hasn't been elected. It's a group of people chosen by other politicians coming from democratic states, but even other states in the UN. And they have a say in this just because the countries that have chosen them, and historically, it has always been someone from, the, from Europe, um, these countries just paid more money into the IMF. And now the IMF comes to Greece and forces politicians, Greek politicians who have been elected in a democratic process, they simply overrule uh, the politicians of Greece. 
And this is problematic. And this is why the IMF has always been criticized for implementing uh, liberal or one could argue neoliberal policies uh, in countries that were close to bankruptcy. That's the IMF. Uh, then we have the Bank for International Settlements, the BIS. The BIS is located where? In Basel, Switzerland. That is why uh, one of its most famous committees, uh, the Committee on Financial Stability and Financial Regulation, is also called the Basel Committee. Uh, Basel Ausschuss für Bankenregulierung. It is conceived as a bank of central banks and has the task of promoting cooperation of central banks in economic and financial market issues, especially financial stability. Does anyone know what the first primary in, and primarily intended goal of the BIS was? <coughs> Quite interesting. It was founded in I would say 1818, I would rather assume it's 1819. Any idea? The BIS was founded, and that's why it was founded in Switzerland as a neutral country. It was founded uh, to channel uh, the reparation payments of Germany after the First World War to France and other countries in Europe. So. After the First World War, Germany had to pay reparation costs to other countries that won the war. And you need a central bank that is neutral uh, to channel those payments. And this is why the BIS was founded in Basel, Switzerland. But nowadays, of course, its goals are completely different. But this, that was the, the foundation of the BIS. And you have the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, uh, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and the IAIS, the International Association of Insurance As uh, Supervisors, that all do virtually the same. They set rules, and they come up with rules and analyses that member central banks should stick to. And the idea is that by having a unified framework of banking and financial supervision, you can reduce regulatory arbitrage and you can create a common uh, and level playing field for all banks and financial intermediaries in the world. And this is something that countries should thrive, strive, thrive to, right? Yeah. Strive, yeah. Okay, thanks. And this is the BIS the Bank for International Settlements. The voting rights also depend on the ownership interest and the BIS is prohibited from accepting bills of exchange and lending to governments. So it is not really a bank, just like the IMF. It doesn't give out loans, it doesn't accept money uh, or deposits. It's just a, it's, it's a supranational association of central banks and supervisors. That is what the BIS is. And last but not least, we have the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank has the task of contributing with own capital resources to a balanced and smooth development of a single market in the interest of the Union. And as a special financial institution, it is located alongside the European Union institution. It is thus not bound by instructions from the European Commission, which is important, because otherwise it would just be uh, an instrument for the European Commun uh, Commission uh, to implement its policies. Capital owners are the member states of the European Union. Additional financing is also provided by issuing bonds. And the main focus of the EIB's work is the improvement of intra-European economic and social cohesion, the development of trans-European networks and environmental protection. For example, if Germany wanted to build a new motorway uh, to Poland, if we wanted to build a new high-speed internet cable across, say, Austria, uh, Germany, and the Czech Republic, this, is some, this would be an infrastructure project that would most likely be co-financed by the European Investment Bank. And you can see this 
with large uh, infrastructure projects, you will usually see a billboard uh, at the construction site saying this project is co-financed by the European Investment Bank because for some reason uh, this is a project that is important to uh, the creation of a single European market. And the prototypical example of such a project would be a motorway across countries. Yeah? If you, if you want to make sure that people uh, can more easily uh, drive from country A to country B, this would be financed and co-financed by the European Investment Bank. Okay. So this is more or less supranational banks and the US banking system. Do you have any questions concerning those two quite different topics? If you go to other countries, you will find sometimes very similar banking sectors and sometimes very different banking sectors. I would assume that, for example, let's say take the Canadian bank sector, I guess it will be, uh, it will be, well, that's not so sure. And some, it's sometimes it's quite similar to the S and sometimes it's more similar to the, uh, to the, uh, European system, depending on whether it's in Quebec uh, or the rest of Canada, There's I guess. Also, like, as well. Yeah. I would no, guess. Queen has some more Queen's on our currency. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in in Japan, actually, uh, it's more similar to Europe uh, because many things. Uh, in Japan uh, evolved uh, as part of the Meiji Revolution in the 19th century, where uh, Japan opened to the world and uh, took a lot of influences from Europe and not so much from the US because the Europeans came in as advisors, the US opened, uh, opened fire with cannons, so that was their type of diplomacy at that time. Um, so the, Jam uh, the Japanese banking system is also very, very peculiar and very special, but it's more closely related to the European sector. Um, and uh, again, from country to country, the banking sector can look quite differently. In some cases, you have uh, a very integrated uh, sector where you only have a bunch, a number of single banks. In some countries, you have a huge amount of small banks. Uh, some countries actually, um, in some countries, for example, the UK, you can see that um, they have a totally different approach to uh, regulation and supervision, meaning that especially in the UK, they are much more uh, innovation and bank frank friendly. Uh, whereas here in Germany, we are still discussing, oh, can we use our bank cards in shops? Uh, they, they have uh, deregulated all of their financial system and uh, financial innovations is, are much easier to enter and have it much easier to enter the market than, for example, in Germany. Uh, and banks are much more innovative with all problems that come along with this. Uh, and the Japanese banking system is also very important, uh, also for research, because it's large and it has had its own problems over the last couple of decades. As you know, uh, the, Jam uh, the Japanese economy uh, is now in its probably 20th year of uh, zero growth. Uh, and it, it is now experimenting with, uh, with something called abenomics, uh, a policy of extremely loose monetary uh, policy. Uh, and some very nice wordings, like for example, zombie banks, uh, they they were first seen in the Japanese banking sector because you had banks that were past bankruptcy, but that were kept alive just in order to stabilize the financial system. Uh, that's a zombie bank. Uh, and of course, you have the Chinese banking system, which is very, very different, very large, evolving. Um, but it's also, of course, very different from all other banking sectors because you have many more cooperative banks yeah? due to the fact that, at least on paper, it's a communist country. Yeah? And you have, obviously, you would expect to see more cooperative banks. Okay, so if you don't have any questions,
uh, I would say we